Okay. You know, to go along with what Rex said, I saw a deal, and you're going to have to forgive me because I can't remember exactly. I saw a deal where they took a timeline of the Bible and they, they made a line, an arch, from one reference to another reference in the Bible. I think it's been on the Internet for a while. I bet everybody's kind of seen it. I believe it was 60,000 cross references that there are in the Bible. They said it is the first hyperlink book to ever exist. And if it was written by one man, that man would be an absolute genius. This was written over a time period of several hundred years, written by over 40 people and in three different languages. They said the amount of cross-references in the Bible is just amazing. The book that we read and the book that we study is, is really something special. Um, so today we're going to be in Numbers. Um, we're going to talk about Balaam today. Now to, to understand a little bit about what's going on with Balaam, we have to understand where Israel's at at this time. Um, Israel's been wandering around for the desert in the desert for close to 40 years. Um, they're, they're reaching the end of their wandering around in the desert. So they're just about getting ready to go into the promised land. Okay? They're in a land called Moab. So if you've got, if you've got the let me see, Jordan River. So say this is the Jordan River running north and south in Israel. Okay, you've got Jericho right here. And Moab is the land just this side of the Jordan River. They're getting ready to cross the Jericho like we see Joshua do. So they're, they're out here on the on the other side of the Jordan River in the land of Moab, and they have just defeated King Og. And remember when we talked about Joshua from, from leaving Egypt and all the things they've done and the way God did the plagues and everything they've done wandering around the desert, the whole world was watching, and the whole world was scared of, of the Israelites. So they just defeat this King Og, and they go, and they're camping in this great big valley in Moab. Moab is also where Moses ends up being buried because he dies there right before they go into the promised land. Well, the king of Moab, his name is Balak, and he is scared of the Israelites, and he, has, he sends for this guy named Balaam. Now, Balaam... If he was an Israelite, he should have been with the Israelites. So Balaam's this guy, but he's, he's a prophet of God, and God talks to him, and he deals back and forth with God. And so he's, Balak says, I want, he, he sends him some money, says, go get Balaam. I want him to come here because I want him to curse Israel. That way maybe I can defeat them. Because I know that the God that Balaam serves is, he listens to Balaam. And, and in, in, verse, uh, in chapter 22 of Numbers, and in verse 6, we see where it says that he who you bless is blessed, and he who you curse is cursed. And then in 8, it says, the Lord speaks to me. This is Balaam talking. So we know that God does speak to Balaam. So, in, uh, so he sends these guys, and Balaam says, okay, well, hold on. You spend the night, let me talk to God. The next morning he gets up and says, I can't go with you. I'm not going to curse these people. So they go back to Balak, and uh, they said he was not going to do it. So Balak says, okay, well, you take everything, take more money, take more, go, go get Balaam. I really need Balaam here. So they go back a second time, and we see this in 22, um, 18... 21, and this is after they've offered him all this stuff. And Balaam says, Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his full house of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord, my God, to do less or more. Now, therefore, please you also stay here tonight that I may know what, the, know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam that night and said to him, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the prince of Moab. Then if you look in 22, which I didn't put it up there, but if you look in verse 22, 
It says, then God's anger arose because he went. Okay, so, so God does not want him to curse Israel. Okay? But Balaam's going to go, and these guys are offering him stuff, but Balaam knows, I can only do what the Lord is going to let me do. So he gets on his donkey, and, and the God is so mad at Balaam that he sends an angel with a sword down to get in Balaam's way. So the donkey's walking down a path, and this angel stands in the middle of the road, and Balaam doesn't see it, but this donkey does. And as this donkey's walking along, he walks over in the ditch, and he gets in the field, and he walks around this angel, and Balaam gets mad, and he beats the donkey. So the angel moves down the path a little ways farther, and he gets in this wide area where there's rocks on both sides, and he stands there in the middle, and this donkey sees this angel and he scoots over and he smashes Balaam's leg on a rock as he walks around this angel and now Balaam just gets furious and Balaam beats the donkey so this third time this angel gets in this little narrow area where there's no way around it and this donkey walks up there and Balaam gets mad because this donkey wouldn't go and Balaam starts beating this donkey and this donkey just lays down so that brings us to Numbers 22, this, is, this cracks me up. 22, verses 28 through 35. And it says, Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and he said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Now, you would think that if the donkey started talking to you, it would set you back a little bit, but not Balaam. And Balaam said to the donkey, Well, because you've abused me, man. I'm, he's a whiner. It's because you've abused me. I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And Balaam said, No. So now he's losing the argument to the donkey. Okay? And then all of a sudden, God opens the eyes of Balaam to where he sees this angel standing there with the sword. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If he had not turned aside from me, I surely would have also killed you by now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did, a, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now therefore, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men but only the words that I speak to you that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So this whole deal, okay, we're going to see in a little bit that Balaam's not the great guy that we seem to think he is, or that he appears to be here. There's, there's some things that we're going to discuss by the time we get to the end of Balaam. Um, and, and it's, you got to kind of jump around a little bit to see it. So God knows who Balaam is and what he's like and he put this angel there and this whole donkey thing was just to try to make sure because God does not want Balaam to curse Israel so God threatened to kill him with this angel and this whole donkey episode so that he would not curse Israel but he goes ahead and goes he goes to Balak Balak takes him up on this hill where he can oversee these millions of people. And, and remember, the Israelites, they traveled in millions. They, they, were, they were a nation by this point, without a land at the moment, overlooking this valley. And Balak takes him up there, and he says, here they are, I want you to curse these people. So Balaam says, okay, we'll give, let, let's build seven altars, get seven bulls, we're going to sacrifice. And, and so they do all the sacrifice, the burnt offering, and he, he tells Balak, he said, you stay here, I'm going to go off and see what God says, and then I'm going to come back. So Balaam goes off, talks to God, comes back, and this is what he says. This is in 23, 
verse 7 through 11. Balak, the king of Moab, has brought for me Aram from the mountains of the east. Come curse Jacob for me, and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I, have beho I behold him. There a people dwell alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let me and let my end be like his. Then in eleven, Balaam said, or Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have blessed them bountifully. So he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak what the Lord has put in my mouth? So the donkey thing worked. He ended up blessing Israel, and Balaam gets, or Balak gets mad. Here I am, I want you to curse these people, and you bless them. What are you doing? That's not what, I'm offering to pay you bunches and bunches of money. I mean, and he's willing to pay because he's scared to death of these Israelites. So, what Balak does is he takes Balaam, and they go to another place. And where they can only see a part of Israel. And he says, okay, just curse this, this part. So, again, they set up the sacrifices, they do the sacrifices. Balaam says, hold on, let me go talk to God. He goes and talks to God. He comes back and he blesses them again. So Balak's just like, this isn't what I had in mind. So one more time. So one last time, he takes Balaam to where they can only see a fraction of what they could see before, and he says, just curse this little part. Well, it's kind of interesting here, because... Now Balaam's getting the idea, and it says, Now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as the other times to seek use of sorcery, but he set his face towards the wilderness. So he didn't even necessarily go talk to God this time. He understands blessing Israel is what God wants, so he just blesses Israel one more time. This is three blessings on Israel, no curses. Balak, then Balak in in. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Okay, so it appears like Balaam's a good guy here and doing what he's supposed to, right? So not only does he stop there, then Balaam ends up giving a fourth prophecy, not where he's asking him to curse, but he ends up cursing a lot of the Moabites and a lot of the people in the land. So it appears like Balaam's doing what God wants. And he did. He did what God wants. But God knew Balaam's heart. Because when we look in verse, in chapter 25, something changes. Okay? And, and to understand this change, and we're going to read a little bit in 25 here real quick, but first I want to go to Revelations. Revelations 2 verses 12 through 17. Now, we're going to get into Revelations, and we're going to discuss a little bit. This is the, where it's talking about the seven churches. Okay? These churches all have some good. A lot of them have some good. Some of them have some bad. Some of them have lost their first love. Some of them um, are lukewarm. I mean, we're not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to talk about the one here in Pergamos today. In verse 12 it says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things, says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Well, now there's Balaam's name. What is the doctrine of Balaam? Well, so far, from what we've seen in the story, Balaam did everything right. But now, this is something that God is holding against the church at Pergamos, 
is they hold to the doctrine of Balaam. So what is that? And Balaam, who taught Balak to put stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Okay, so now, what did Balaam do? Well, he, put, he taught Balak to put a stumbling block in front of Israel. Then we throw in the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? Well, that's a hard thing to know there. I don't know... Uh, a couple of theories. They, they had a lot to do with eating stuff sacrificed to idols. And some people say that, I'll give you two theories, nothing I can hang my hat on. One of them is that the, the wording where it comes from, something in the name means to eat, and they ate stuff sacrificed to idols, and they were almost gluttons. When you look at some things, it's like they, they went overboard and like encouraged people to eat stuff sacrificed to idols, which is a no-no. Another, another theory is that when they started the church, there was a deacon named Nicholas. From what I have found about him, he was raised um, with the Greek mythology, converted to Judaism, and then converted to Christianity. And then when they're setting up the church, Nicholas becomes one of the deacons that starts helping. He's one of them in, in uh, Acts that starts helping. And some people believe that he started a church, but yet he couldn't let go of his beliefs from the past and kind of incorporated some things to make a religion that wasn't quite right. We know whatever the Nicolaitans were, they had to do with eating stuff sacrificed and probably sexual morality, immorality because it compares him to the doctrine of Balaam. So let's get back to Balaam. So let's go back and see what happens in Numbers. In 25... I took my marker out. Now Israel remained in Assyria Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to sacrifice um, to the sacrifice of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord arose against Israel. Okay, so you think well, maybe that's just a coincidence. Well, let's look in Numbers 31, 16. It says, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the inc incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So because of Balaam's counsel to Balak, the thing that happened it ha starts happening in verse 25, it comes from Balaam. So what Balaam did is he did everything right up to this point, but then as he's leaving, because in the end of 24 it says, now Balaam pack up and leave, he goes to Balak, and he says, if you want to get to Israel, send your women down there amongst the people. If you want to get to Israel, I know you want to curse them, I couldn't curse them, God wouldn't let me curse them. But if you want to get to Israel, you send your harlots down there, and you get them... Now, Jacob had moved to Egypt because Joseph was there. They became a nation in Egypt. There's really no, there's really no record yet. This is the first time that it shows Israel getting s saturated with pagan worship. Okay? And it's all because of Balaam. I don't know if it was a test before they went into the promised land where God's trying to cleanse people or what, but God, Balaam, says, you know what? Send your women down there. Human nature, they're pretty. Get your gods in there. They'll worship them. Now, did Balaam, did Balaam get paid for this? I don't know. 
Was he afraid for his life because Balak was that mad at him? I don't know. But I know when you look through the scripture, when they talk about the doctrine of Balaam, it's that he put a stumbling block, purposely put a stumbling block in the way of Israel. Israel fights this and struggles with this from now on. We see that through judges. We see that through the kings. We see this constant cycle of worshiping other pagan gods. A circle. God delivers them from it. They go back to it. God delivers them from it. They go back to it. And Balaam purposely did that. So now, let's go back to Revelations for a second. So you understand the seven churches of Revelation. So now, what we can say from this, do you know there's churches in the end time? Well, this one at Pergamos, and and I think this is an example of several churches in the end time, purposely putting stumbling blocks in the way of Christians, practicing. Now, do they do it on purpose? I don't know. Satan is doing it on purpose. I don't know that the people always know what's going on. But Satan purposely is trying to constantly, through the churches, put stumbling blocks in the way of Christians. Because they practice the doctrine of Balaam. You know, I liked Rex's, I liked Rex's community meditation. It talks about studying the word. It talks about the word being rock solid. You know, I talk to a lot of people that believe what they believe because they've been told that's what they should believe. I've got family that I talk to that believe what they believe because that's what they've been told to believe. I think salvation is an important enough thing that we should all be in the Word. Because Here, let's, let's, look, at, let's look at 1 John 4.1. Beloved, do you believe every spirit, or do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets prophets have gone out into the world. Let's look at Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets. Oh, well, there it is again. Beware of the spirit of Balaam which is in the churches not all churches but we need to be on guard against this as Christians today because it's in enough of them beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing in other words they're going to look like angels of light they're going to look just as right as rain But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who are, you who practice lawlessness. Salvation isn't something to take lightly. Our walk with God isn't something to take lightly. You know, if you're going to build a house, you don't just start off on your own and just, you you find the people that know what they're doing and you build the best house you can. It's our responsibility to get into the Word and to study. And if you're a Christian here today and you don't have a Bible study that you're a part of or something where you're, walking and searching a Sunday school class, a Bible study or something it's very important 
to get into the Word and study, just like Rex was talking about in his communion meditation today. It's not something just to leave up to happenstance on if we're listening to the right people. The Internet, like Rex brought up, is another thing. It's a great tool to find a lot of answers, but you have to be extremely careful, and the stuff that you find, you have to mirror to the Word of God to make sure it's right, because there's something about being told something we tend to want to believe it. And if we read it or we see it on the Internet, it's easy to think it's true. Well, I heard this. I mean, and I'm that way. I mean, I hear something, and there was something the other day I heard, and then I repeated it, and it was so stupid, I can't believe I even didn't even think about it enough to, that I repeated it. I can't remember what it was. I wouldn't tell you if I did. <laughs> we have this tendency to want to hear what people say and just believe it because that's kind of the nature that we have. But when it comes to our salvation, we need to be in the Word. What's that? Oh. I thought somebody said something. And I'm used to teaching Sunday school where people just... Uh, Anyway, so as I close today, I, that's, that's what I want. I want to challenge you. I'm not going to do an altar call today. I'm just, I'm just going to close. I don't, and we have some people that are going to come up front here in a second. I want to challenge you. If, if you're not in the Word, and if you're not seeking the truth, you know, the Bible also says, he who seeks finds. If you're the kind of person that is looking and you're striving, God's going to show you the answers. It's just really easy in today's world. We get busy, and it's easy just to lay back and let everybody else do the work for us. That's not what Christianity is about. It's a, it's a walk. This is how he speaks to us. This is how we know what he wants. This is how we know what he wants us to do and what we, the decisions that we should make. And not only that, when we look at Balaam and we look at the church in Revelation and we look at so many of the other churches, Satan is so sly at making things look just right. And it's really easy, and, and I think there's a lot of people in this world today that get led astray by the wolves that are in sheep's clothing. So I want to challenge you today, if you're not in the Word, and I know many of you are, I'm not talking, man, we need to be in the Word. That's the kind of people we need to be. We need to know why we believe what we believe, and we need to be able to go to the Word and explain it to people. That's the kind of people we need to be. I know a lot of people that can tell you what they believe, but they don't know why. They can't go to the scripture and tell you why. We need to be able to back it up. We need to be able to say, I believe this, and this is why. So I'm just going to leave you with a challenge this morning, more than an altar call. And I'm going to challenge you that if you're not in that place, maybe we need to look and maybe put ourselves in that place. So this morning, we have a family that wants to join the church. So I'm going to ask them to come up today. And we, we have found an old paper. Now this, this paper, and I'm going to ask them some questions off this paper because this paper has a history. Anita Crawshaw came by my house and said, I've got the papers of all the members of the church. Well, when we first started, we came up with a paper that we, uh, we wrote down some basic things that we wanted members to believe, and we all a bunch of us signed them. And uh, then we've kind of gotten away from that. People have been baptized and become members. And, but we found this, because they, they approached us or in, in a roundabout way. We've just, they have decided that they would like to join our church. So I'm going to ask them up here. And I'm going to ask them, there's four, four questions that are on here that we sign. And the first one is, do you believe in the virgin birth? Yes. Okay. Have you been baptized by immersion? Yes. Okay. Do you... Uh, Oh, well, where's the fourth one? Okay, you're speaking for her? Okay, okay. No, she'd probably cause problems if she was up here anyway. Oh, for those of you that don't know, this is Joe DeVitro and Christy. Ah, Kennedy. Kennedy, okay. She's not in my kids' class. I know I know Jacqueline. She's in Eli, or Jed's class. Yeah, <laughs> Kennedy. I'm sorry, Kennedy. And uh, they are from Minnesota and have come down here, and they've been attending church for quite some time, and, and Joe, he's a interesting fellow good friend of mine I would say this whole family is a good friend of mine what yes do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God yes okay and then this is a statement to you uh, 